Hey, we're going to take our Bibles and turn to Proverbs 23. Proverbs 23. I know it was uh, nine sermons ago that I was here. Preach, and you have no idea. What did you preach last time? Well, I'm going to review it because I didn't finish, and I'm going to try to finish today. And so I, I didn't get to my third point. And, it, and actually, I was able to go over and, and uh, <laughs> expand it, so now it's a new message. So I, and I've got three points for this third point. And I know I won't get through the third point, so it'll, that one will turn into part three. So you can either title this, How's Your Appetite, Part Two, or you can, um, you can title it as a brand new sermon and say, How to Control Your Appetites, because, you know, I gave you all the bad news last time, and I didn't actually give you a fix for the problem. Um, before I get into that, I do want to comment a, a little bit. Our, I noticed our song really was a good theme for missions, and Brother Gambrell was supposed to be here, as you know. He took ill. He and I, and his wife and I, his wife, he and his wife, my wife and I, had the opportunity to uh, go out and get something to eat after the evening service on Sunday. We spent some time talking, and uh, one of the things, you know, I asked him, Do you, get, you probably don't get out much right these days. He says, no, he says, but when I have an opportunity to go where there's young people who might be interested in missions, I make the effort. That's why he wanted to come to Fairhaven Baptist College and church. And uh, he was able to uh, preach Sunday evening. And I, there, there was one part of the, one verse of the song that we didn't sing that I'd like to read. It says, a day of pleasure or a feast of friendship. A house or car or garments fair and fame will all be trash when souls are brought to heaven. And then how sad to face the slacker's blame. We discussed why so few people are interested in missions. He, he, he asked, so is there more interest in the missions program now? And I said, well, there's some interest, but not like it used to be. We don't have anyone just dying to go to the mission field. And we could come and preach and all we want about missions and the great need, and people say, oh, yeah, that's great need. Oh, yeah, hope someone goes. But you know what? People aren't going to go. People aren't going to surrender. Why? Because this fourth stanza, they would rather have a day of pleasure. They'd rather have their house, their car, their garments fair the fame. You know what the problem is? We love the world. Instead of loving the world. It's two definitions of the world, my friends. God said, love not the world. And that's what we love, this world system. And yet Jesus died for the world. And the Bible says, for God so loved the world, talking about the people. But we're so caught up with the things of the world that the people of the world, who cares? That's the problem. That's why we don't have more people surrendering to missions. He made a comment in a sermon on Sunday evening that we'll know we have revival in this country when the airports are lined with people going to the mission field. And my friends, the only place you're going to find an airport lined with people going to, to the mission field and coming from the mission field is Salt Lake City, Utah. I've been there. I've seen it. Dr. Mitchell, you've seen it, haven't you? There's always someone going in a big family group sending them or a big family group waiting for them to come back. And that's the Mormons going to go spread their cultic message. And yet, we've got the truth. We've got our fire insurance. And the problem is our appetite. And I'm, not, I'm glad I didn't get finished. I really wanted to finish. God had it all worked out. I'm glad I didn't get finished because I get to do part two. Let's read the scripture. 
Proverbs 23, verses 1 through 3, because really, I never really get to comment too much on the very text that I had started with, and I hope to do that before we end, end today. When thou sittest to eat with a ruler, consider diligently what is before thee, and put a knife to thy throat, if thou be a man given to appetite. Be not desirous of his dainties, for they are deceitful meat. Let's pray. Lord, there's a lot of deceitful meat out there. There's a lot of pleasures of this world that we long for, we chase after, we've accepted as okay, we've accepted as normal. I pray that you would get a hold of our hearts. All of that will be trash when this world is over. It's going to burn. It's going to go up and smoke. We'll have nothing but a pile of ashes to lay at your feet instead of crowns, instead of souls. I pray that you would help us today. Lord, I, I've got a, a lot written down. I don't know what you want said, focused on. I pray that you'd guide through the message. Help us, Lord, to really take a look inside again, make sure that we have the right appetites. and Lord, do what we need to do to control our appetites for the world, we ask in Jesus' name. I had mentioned this different kinds of appetites. There's survival appetites, there's spiritual appetites, and there's sensual appetites, those things that we, we long for and crave in the world. I said that appetites are followed. You go toward what you're hungry for. And then we mentioned that, and we, by the way, we used uh, Lot as the example, didn't we? And we saw that he, he pitched his tent toward Sodom. He had an appetite toward the world. But it wasn't long before he was living in Sodom, and then he was affected by Sodom. He was, he was acting like them. He, he, he had sold out his morals. He was willing to give his daughters up to, to the perverts. And so his whole life changed simply because he was leaning toward the world. Do you think he ever thought he'd get as far as he did? No. But he was there because he had an appetite. And we mention also that appetites are fed. So they're followed, but they're fed. And when you feed something, it grows. And you get a little taste for the world, a little taste for the world's entertainment, their music, their videos, their dress styles, their hairstyles, all of those things. You get a taste for it. You want a little more. And you feed it. And it grows. And it becomes a monster. And... As we saw, Lot, was he, he actually fit in with the heathen. He became influenced by them, and, and his appetites caused him to lose everything that was dear to him. And we noticed how he fed his appetites. In 2 Peter 2.8, it says, For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing. Those are the two gates that are going to get you the most. In seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day. It was day to day. Day by day, he fed his appetites. He was seeing, seeing things he shouldn't see. He was hearing things he shouldn't hear. And it went and it progressed. A little bit more. And a little bit more. Why? Because the eyes of man are never satisfied. We're never satisfied with, with, with our appetites. We always want a little bit more. And of course, I mentioned, I pulled out my cell phone. What greater way can you corrupt yourselves? And what the most simplest way was that s stupid little thing that fits in our hand. Seeing and hearing. You can see and hear everything the world has to offer right here. You can just go in the privacy of your own room, you can sneak somewhere, and it's all right there. The entire world is there. And the average person in America is glued to this thing. And the average Christian is glued to it. We love our cell phone. Why? Oh, because it's a great tool. It is a tool. And you can do some good things with it. 
But unfortunately, that's not how most people use it. You can say all you want. It's a good tool for good, yes. But how are you using it? And so we've got these lusts. We've got these appetites. Everybody has an appetite. We, we mentioned that. Every man is drawn away after his own lust and enticed. Everybody has an appetite. Every adult, every staff member, every high schooler, every college student. Even Mr. Kelso back there. Doesn't matter how old you are, everybody has wrong appetites. And so what are we supposed to do about those things? We're supposed to do some things about that, because some obviously don't. That's why they get themselves in trouble. And some of you are heading for trouble, and you don't realize it. You're, you're on the same road that Lot was on, and you haven't figured it out yet. Or maybe you have figured it out. Well, maybe this is a... And you haven't taken any steps to do anything about it. So that's what I want to give you today. The third point was appetites are to be frustrated, or as I said, this could be your new sermon title, How to Control Your Appetites. You've got to control. Appetites are meant to be controlled. They're not supposed to control you, but you look in the average person's life, their appetite controls them. If you're hungry for something, what do you want? What do you do? You eat it, right? You want something sweet? Snack shop's closed? All the vending machines are right there, aren't they? They're right there. And I heard business has been booming. I mean, exploding. They were coming in and filling and refilling and refilling. Why? I want it. And so I can have it. Instant gratification. That's how we live. If it's too hot... We turn up the air conditioner. If it's too cold, we change the, seat, the heat setting. Everything is right there. We can have everything we want. And unfortunately, a lot of people for years have yielded to their appetites and have never taken steps to get them under control. You know, let me say, some of you have had some parents who've been hard and have tried to Keep you in control. But you know what? you got to grow up sometime. Mom and dad's not going to be there forever. Standing over your shoulder saying, hey, you got to change this. You can't do this. you got to watch this. They're not going to be there. And if you don't take some steps, you're going to be far down that road. Some of you never had a mom and dad who would really forcefully Stay on top of you and control your appetites and tell you no. So for years, you've just fed your appetites. That's two di totally different groups of people, but they still have the same need. And the same need is whether you were trained or whether you weren't trained, whether you were constrained or not, you have got to rise up and take what the Bible says and live it for yourself. So I want to give you three things, or at least two. <laughs> Here's what you can do to control a worldly appetite. Letter A, or number one, however you want to put it, sidestep it. It has to be alliterated, so. Sidestep it. In other words, get away from it. Does that make sense? Go back to Genesis chapter number 19, because that's where we were with our friend Lot. Oh, if you're saved, you're going to see him in heaven. Genesis chapter number 19. Lot did not want to leave the world. He got in so deep, he didn't want to get out. And in chapter 19, verse 15 and 16, And when the morning rose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. He said, let's get out of here. 
And then verse 16, what does it say? And while he did what? He lingered. He lingered. He, his appetite got him. He was there. He didn't want to give it up. He did not want to get away from it. That's the problem with some of you. You've got a taste for a certain kind of music. You linger. You linger on those social media sites. You linger. You just pause. You just stay. You're just not ready to give it up. That's your problem. And until you make a decision, I'm, I'm done with this thing, you're going to continue to stay there. And if he had stayed there, he would have been destroyed. God was merciful. So verse 16, And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand, and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters. They all wanted to stay there. None of them left on their own accord. Then it says, The Lord, being merciful unto him, they brought him forth and set him without the city. Of course, we know what happened. Lot's wife turned back. Why? Because she wanted to stay there. She just couldn't let it go. I mentioned, I think, in the last time I preached, that angels are messengers, God's messengers. And God sends godly people to point out your sin. And if you ignore that and drag your feet and want to linger in it, there's something wrong. You have to admit one thing. You love the world. That's, that's the problem. You love it. You're not ready to give it up. You're not ready to sidestep it. You're not ready to get away from it. And whatever you're attracted to, you've got to get away from it. You've got to run from it. 2 Timothy 2, 22 says, Flee also youthful lusts. Turn to Genesis chapter 39. Verse number 7. And it came to pass, talking about Joseph, after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph. And she said, lie with me. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that Joseph had desires in, in his life? Sure he did. Okay? So here's this woman, says, hey, let's go. Verse 8, but he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wanteth not what is with me in the house, and if he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And it came to pass as she spake to Joseph, there it is, day by day. Thankfully, what did he do? He hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. He didn't even want to be around her. He was trying to sidestep her and get away from her at any, any occasion he could do that. He was trying to, hey, let's keep me away. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business, that there was none of the men of the house there within. And she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand. And he fled and got him out. He was tempted to feed his desires. But two things he did. The first thing he did was he thought about his relationship with God. He said, How can I do this? How can I sin against my God? And the reason why we don't get away from the world is because we don't stop to think about our relationship with God. Why don't you stop and think about who He is? He is the Savior. He left heaven to come to this place. You say, well, but this is a great place, this world. Yeah, that's the problem. You got it all wrong. Set your attention, set your affection on things above not on things on the earth. 
That's how he got out of it. And so the first thing he did is he, he thought about his relationship with God, and the second thing he did is he ran. He just got away from it. That's what you got to do. I was traveling uh, in, as uh, an evangelist neighborhood Bible time several years ago, many years ago. <laughs> and uh, as I, I was out traveling, we had to go and do a laundry somewhere. I think it was during a training session. So we had to go to the laundromat to do our laundry. And in the laundromat, there comes this song that I knew from back in the day. And it was just, I knew, I knew the, every, the next word. I knew the next groan. I knew the next bend of the guitar string. I could tell you what was going to happen next. I knew the whole thing. It was there. It was here. It was there. And here's this thing, and I'm trying to do my laundry. I'm trying to train to go out and serve the Lord as a summer evangelist. And here's this music. You know what I did? I got out of there. I couldn't get the thing out of my mind, so I just left. I just left. This, I just, I, I got to get out of this thing. Now, of course, I had to run back in later and put, change things up, but I didn't stay in there. Why? Because it was getting to me, and I didn't want it to get to me. And we have to make a conscience eff, conscious effort to stay away from things that appeal to us. Make sense? Okay, guys, if you have an appetite for immodestly dressed women, um, don't go where they hang out. Make sense? That's why you don't go to the beach. That's a, that's a no-brainer. That's why you don't hang out at the mall. Why do you hang out? Why do people hang out at the mall? They're not buying stuff. They're just hanging out. That's a, that's, that's, that's a problem. This is a rest, that's a recipe for disaster. Okay? You've got to watch out where you're going. There's some websites you should not visit, and I'm not just talking about the X-rated ones. There's some, there's some, you could just find the wrong thing on, quote-unquote, innocent websites. I'm just shopping. <laughs> there's a lot of things for sale that aren't good. And you know how they're advertised. There's just some places you don't go. And you avoid. Go to the self-checkout line where they don't have the magazine rack staring at you in the face or something. Do what you've got to do to avoid things. We've got to make a conscious effort to stay away from it. Remember how Lot messed up his life? I already mentioned. By seeing and hearing. That's how he vexed his righteous soul. That word vex means to torture. When you get into sin and you've let the world grab, grab a hold of you, you think you're having fun, but you're miserable inside. You may be sitting here today and say, I don't have peace. There's something disturbing. I can't put my finger on it. I can help you. It's the world. You're seeing and hearing. You're vexing yourself. You're troubling yourself. You're tormenting yourself. Oh, but it's fun. No, it's not. Not if you're Christian. If you feed that worldly appetite day by day, you're going to fall. you got to get away. Proverbs 4, 14 and 15 says, Enter not into the path of the wicked, and go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it. Pass not by it. Turn from it. Pass away. Get away. So first of all, sidestep it. Secondly, starve it. Don't feed your carnal appetites. That's pretty simple. The text verse that we started with gives good advice. That he said, and put a knife to thy throat, if thou be a man given to appetite. Now, the idea of putting a knife to your throat is figurative, okay? Uh, What it's talking about is, is restraint. Learn to restrain yourself. Starve it. Paul put it this way, I die. How often? Yeah. Well, he did. Might be a good thing if we did. Every day, no. 
Jesus made it clear, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. The only way we can follow him is to deny ourselves first. Take up that cross. Cross means pain. But I want to do that. I want to look at that. I want to touch this. I want to taste that. I want to have this experience. I want to feel this. I want to listen to this. No! Deny yourself. But I want to. Tough. <laughs> I mean, it's simple. It's not easy. But it's simple. And we don't do that. Why? Because we love it. You know, as long as you have a, an, an ear and an eye for the world, don't expect God to make his will, will clear to you. Can't you just give up something that keeps bothering you and pestering you and is preventing you from finding, discovering God's will for your life? I mean, some of you are making some serious decisions. What you're going to do the rest of your life. Who you're going to marry. Who you're going to be interested in. And you've got a, 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 an appetite for the world. I tell you, you're not going to have the right relationship. You're not going to have the right appetite for the right person. And if you do, it's going to be, maybe you do, have, you do like the right person, but you like them for the wrong reason. Hey, that person might be a godly person, but you don't like them because they're godly. You like them because they're good looking. That's not the foundation you ought to have. So carnal, starve it. Put the knife to your throat. Not literally. Tell yourself no. Ever have, have you ever gotten the munchies? Man, once you start eating... It doesn't stop, does it? It's just like, wow. <laughs> My kids will tell you, man, if, I'm, just like, I'm, not, I'm hungry. And I have, and I, oh, oh, man. And it's just, I got to, it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. But if, I'll tell you, if you simply walk away from that food in the first place, believe it or not, your appetite, that craving begins to dissipate. It may take a while, but it will. When you want something and you know it's wrong, you've got to refuse to cave in. That's pretty simple. And when you'll find that the urge to do that sin will go away if you starve it. If you yield to it just a little bit, that appetite for that sin becomes ferocious. That's what happens. It's time for a spiritual fast. After fasting for a while... You know what happens? You actually begin to lose your appetite. You say, really? <laughs> yeah, try it sometime. The same thing will happen to your, your appetite for the world. If you begin to starve it long enough, you kind of lose an appetite. It's like, it doesn't even appeal to me anymore. You know? You know, beer used to appeal to me. I never liked the taste. But it has, it has no appeal to me right now. Why? As I'm walking with the Lord. Some of you need to starve yourself of the world. Starve yourself of your social media obsession. Do you know you can actually close accounts? <laughs> you can. You can starve yourself of certain types of music. Draw the line and say, there's certain groups, there's certain genres. I never know if, how, how to say that word right. There's certain things you can just draw a line and say, I'm not listening, I'm not going there anymore. And you, you, you rein in what you're going to listen to. You starve yourself of videos. Limit the number of good films you watch and certainly cut out anything that leads toward the world. Starve yourself of, uh-oh, listening to comedians. That's the thing now, isn't it? Some of you live for fun. Life's all about laughing and having fun. Let me tell you, it's hard to listen to a comedian. Oh, but this is a Christian comedian. You know, I don't care what they call themselves. You know, they get close to the line sometimes, and very frequently they go over the line, and you laughed at it. You know, let me say something. Your life 
must be very empty if you have to prop up your happiness with a comedy act. Let that one sink into your head. You've got zero of a life if you've got to be happy by pumping yourself of comedy all the time. You don't like it? You've got a wrong appetite. Starve yourself! Say, I'm done with this. I don't need the world. The reason you won't starve yourself is because you love it. And I'll remind you, 1 John 2.15, still there. Love not the world. But I love it. Yeah, being attracted to the world is not a light matter. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God, James 4.4. 4. You want to be at odds with God? Unfaithfulness is what he's talking about. That's going to be judged. And we need to learn to hate evil. The psalmist said, through thy precepts I, understand, I, I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. That's how we've we got to hate it. We've got to starve it. And then let me, I will give you the third one, kind of. Not the whole load. Number three, spoil it. You sidestep it. You starve it. And you spoil it. How many have ever been told by your mom that if you eat too many snacks before the meal, you're going to spoil your what? Your appetite. She's preparing this nice meal, and you're just in there snacking. I can't wait. And it's such an insult to, the, to, the, to, the, to your mom. You, you don't realize that. And she's working hard, and you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And she's like, I've got good food, and you're just, you, know. you spoil your appetite. Why? Because you fill up with, you know, you load up on Twinkies and chips, and you don't have an appetite for the spaghetti or the lasagna or whatever she's making for you. And the principle works when you're trying to cut back on junk food. You simply load up on enough nutritious food that you won't have room for dessert. So, oh, no, man, i got to have room for that. <laughs> you know, the Bible says this, and this is true, of course, because it's in the Bible, right? Proverbs 27, 7, the full soul loatheth and honeycomb. When you're so full, you ever been so full that they bring out dessert and you're like, I'm sorry. Should have told me ahead of time. <laughs> The food was so, I mean, I've been so full, and, and then they bring out something that really looks like it would have looked good, like a half hour before. But I have no appetite. Why? Because I'm full. Why don't you fill up with the good stuff that you don't have room for the junk in your life anymore? That's your problem. You haven't spoiled your appetite for the world. Fill up with righteousness. Fill up with truth. Fill up with service. You fill up with God. I'm telling you, you're going to have less of an appetite. The things of the world, just they don't have that pull anymore. And if they got that pull, it's because you haven't been feeding the right appetite. You know that music that you couldn't live without before? It becomes annoying. It's like, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen? Get a taste of God. You want to be happy? Fill yourself with his word. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after what? Righteousness. And they shall be filled, right? I don't have time. You can turn sometime to Psalm 63. I challenge you. This is a Psalm of David when he was in the wilderness. And what did he long for? Go in there and circle every time you see the word thee. You'll see he wasn't just wanting all of God's blessings. He wanted God. When you come to prayer, it's not about getting something from him. Why don't you want him instead of the world? Spoil your appetite for the world by filling yourself up with the Lord. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes.